It's almost more full than a Sunday morning. It's good to see you all. We're just going to enter straight into worship.
somebody worship in the house today we bless your mighty name Lord God father we thank you for a wonderful name it is in Jesus father we come to celebrate you at this midweek service Lord God father we thank you Lord God for your presence in this house today father we glorify the mighty name the name of all names we love you oh God we love you oh God Hallelujah. Come on, don't stop worshiping. Come on, lift up your name, your voices today. Just lift up your voices on him today. Hallelujah. We worship you, God. Hallelujah. 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 We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, we thank you, God. We thank you for the sweetest name. I don't know about you, but it feels so good to be in the house on a Wednesday night. I don't know about you, but I've missed it. I've missed it. Hallelujah. It is so good to see each one of you on a Wednesday, this first Wednesday as we relaunch an in-person gathering. So it is so good, and I thank you for being here this Wednesday. Amen. I want you to shout to one side to the other and just say hello. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's so good to see you guys. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Young people, you can head downstairs. Praise the Lord. Well, you sounded pretty good. It sounded like you missed Wednesday night's church just as much as I did. Praise the Lord. You know what? I enjoy doing the online kind of thing, but I tell you what, it got old real quick because I wanted to be with people. I wanted to be with people where I could see them receiving the word, amen. I couldn't see what you were doing. You may have been cooking at the house on a Wednesday night while watching, you know, online. It's not the same thing, amen. Praise the Lord. Just a few announcements this evening. Uh, we want to remind you, as always, you give your offering in the offering box in the, in the lobby or text your offering or give online at victoryjasper.com as well. If you're a guest here, text WELCOME to the number on the screen, 77411. Also want to remind all the men this evening and those that are watching, this Saturday at 8 o'clock is our men's breakfast, and we want to invite you. We have a special guest, uh, the Tennessee men's director, Jack Harper. He's also the husband of Sheila Harper, and they've co-founded together Safe One. And we want to encourage you to be here this weekend on Sunday morning. Jack Harper is going to be preaching on Father's Day this Sunday. If you have forgotten that this Sunday is Father's Day, is a reminder. Uh, so he'll be preaching both services at 9 and 11 o'clock. So we want to encourage you to be here this coming Sunday. Amen? Praise the Lord. Well, tonight and the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about the end. You know, and you could probably say this is the beginning of the end, if you will. Uh, the beginning of the sermon, the end. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> and uh, what has been transpiring across our nation, around the world for the last few months, many have asked, is this the end times? 
Are we close to the rapture? Are we coming to life as we know it? But let me remind you this evening that no one knows the hour or the day of the Lord's return. But as anything else, like we know, uh, if we're going through a situation, uh, uh, a sickness, there are symptoms. And God has placed those symptoms to be looking for. And, uh, and, and I tell you what, every single one of us knows symptoms of COVID-19, right? But how many of us know the symptoms of the coming of the Lord? Amen? You know, I think we need to be more concerned about the coming of the Lord than anything else. Okay? So, so these next few weeks, we're going to be talking about what a lot of people are talking about. And uh, we've, had, we've had numerous calls, people conversing with us, what are my thoughts about what's going on, is this part of the end times, and so forth. Um, but I want to talk about what the scripture says, not what I think is what the word of God says, okay? There's a lot of theories, there's a lot of uh, uh, different concepts of what is happening, but I want you to decide for yourself out of your Bible, what we're in this evening and throughout these next few weeks. So I want to encourage you, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I want to encourage you to write a lot of notes. There's a lot of scripture when it comes to uh, the end times. There's a lot of scripture, a lot of things that God has to say about it. And uh, so write down some scripture, go home and digest it. And uh, just see what the Lord speaks to you, okay? So I want to be up front and say that some of the things that we have experienced, some of the things that we read in the Bible can be unbelievable. It seems like how in the world can that happen, okay? But can I just say those things that has come to pass, it only has come to pass because of God. So I want you to understand that, that, that point. So here in Matthew chapter 24... Let's look at verse 4. Matthew 24, beginning of verse 4. In that verse, it says, Jesus answered. Okay, because the disciples were kind of ha having these inquiring mind moments. And many of us have had those moments, those inquiring minds, like many of us do. Are we in the end times? Are we in the last days? So Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. Let's just stop there. We're going to break this down, and I don't know how long this is going to take. We may have to make two parts out of this first part. But it says, no one deceives you. Let no one deceives you. There are many people that are deceiving. Look around you today. There's a lot of things that are going on that we don't know if it's true. We've never heard the terminology fake news in the last few years. There's a lot of things going on, and it's up to you and allow the Holy Spirit to bring discernment on what's right and what's wrong. And you have to allow the Holy Spirit to bring direction to the Word where you get your answers, okay? So I said, don't let no one deceive you, verse 5, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Let's pause there for a moment. For many will come in my name. Personally, I think the Antichrist is alive and well and on the earth right now. I believe his head we haven't identified, but I believe he's alive and well. Okay, now it says that you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Come on, we have, we have uh, heard about China. We've heard about Russia. We heard about Iran. We heard about all these countries that are talking about war. And now, here in the last few weeks, there's a war within our own nation. Someone is saying this. Someone is saying that. And, and all this is causing conflict among our own people. And sadly enough, there's conflict even among church people. Okay? And we need to understand that, that the enemy has unleashed a demonic force that has blinded the minds of men and women. They have, I mean, it is ugly. If you've been hiding under a rock, Get out of that rock because it is ugly out there. It is ugly. And the demonic forces are up and, and moving around. 
And he says in verse, five, in verse 6, such things must happen, but the end is still to come. So somebody asks, how do we pray? My prayer is, Lord, your will be done. If this has to take place, who am I to say, stop it, God? All this has to take place. So, yeah, we pray, God, help us. God, sustain us. God, give us the strength. But, Lord, your will be done. Lord, your will be done. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Verse 9, then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Hello? I mean, the hatred is all over the place. Hatred over law enforcement. Hatred over the color. Hatred. Kim and I were watching a video on social media of a man beating up a woman. And the person that's videoing is not, in, not getting involved. That's crazy. That's hatred. You know, and, 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 and it says that we will be persecuted. If you think you're persecuted, then you don't know what persecution is. You know, in China where they're closing down churches and they're, they're burning Bibles and all this stuff, that's persecution. Will that come to, to the USA? I don't know. I didn't dream what's going on here the last few weeks. Who's to tell that would happen? I don't know. But here it says hate one another and many false prophets will appear and deceive many because of the increase of wickedness. I mean, it looks like these last three months when we went full speed ahead, the throttle was moved up and worse. I mean, things in our nation around the world is moving in fast speed, in fast mode. The lawlessness, what was once a crime, people are just being let loose. Everything is backwards. Everything is off track. Because of increase of wickedness. Look at this part. The love of most will grow cold. The love of most will grow cold. The ones we had love for law enforcement, now there's a big target on law enforcement. The love of most. But here I think Jesus was talking about the love for him. Now me personally, in these last two and a half, three months, I believe God allows certain things to take place to develop and raise up the remnant. <laughs> Developing the remnant because I'll be honest with you, there's some here from the Victory family that probably have not seen church online in about three months. Oh, we know who comes on and who doesn't. We see whose name comes up and who doesn't. We see their postings. We see their languages. The love of most will grow cold. Verse 13, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come now jump down to verse 36 no one knows about the day or the hour not even the angels in heaven nor the son but only the father as it was in the days of noah so will be the coming of the son of man for in the days before the flood, people were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in a marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Verse 40, two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill and one will be taken and the other left. Verse 42, therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Now go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Because here, I'm trying to lay a foundation this evening and for these next few weeks. 
So here tonight, I'm just going to give you a little, a little taste so you guys can keep coming back on Wednesday nights. Okay? So I want to be upfront with you. The Bible has a lot of prophecies. Amen? The events that we're witnessing today, we may call them weird, we may call them unusual, we may have a different name for them. Just like the Old Testament prophecies that prophesied that Jesus will come and be born of a virgin. Now at that time, that was like ridiculous. Are you serious? That's, that, that's the prophecy that the Son of Man will be born from a virgin? That was prophetic. And all these prophecies, whether you believe Jesus is Lord or not, you kind of have to admit today that he did come. And there may be a lot of skeptics who look at these prophecies and say, man, these are weird. These are crazy. There's no way that these could have been fulfilled if there wasn't a God. And there are a lot of skeptics who have been transformed by the unusual, the oddities, the strangest things. <laughs> but one thing we need to understand and what's crazy is that literally there are five times as many prophecies about the second coming of the Lord than there were for the first time. Five times more. And we're going to look at those at the first, in the first few weeks here. Now, you may find, like I said earlier, a lot of interpretations that some people will believe some things and others will believe other things. And I'm going to just give you what the Bible says. And next week, we're going to look what happens after the, after the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And there, there, there are some Christians from all different sides of the spectrum. And I'm not here to debate you. I'm not here to have an argument about it. I'm here just to tell you what the Bible says. And if you have a difficulty of digesting and swallowing what is being said, then just take it up with God and just read what the Word of God says, okay? Don't, don't come and, and bash me and, and all this stuff. Don't, don't schedule an appointment and say, I disagree with you. I'm just going to be preaching the Word of God, okay? And most of you know that I, I, I preach the, what the Word, okay? So... So next week, we're going to look what, what heaven's like and all that stuff. And how we're judged versus those who are not Christians. We're going to look at heaven and what eternity, eternity will be like. And then in the, in, in the final week, hopefully, we're going to take a, 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 an overview of the book of Revelation as it pertains to the end times. So we're going to, we're going to package everything in, in, into this because you, when you talk about the end times, you got to dig into the book of Revelation. So we're going to give you a survey of the book of Revelation. So this evening, we're going to look at Thessalonians. And let me give you a little backdrop of the Thessalonian church. This first century Christians were so convinced that Jesus was coming and returning. They knew that he was coming back at any moment. Maybe if it was this Friday, maybe, maybe this Saturday. And they were, they were all concerned and pretty much they were freaking out. What's going to happen to those who have died before the return of the Lord? Are they going to miss out on what is to come? And so Paul was writing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 to explain what's going to happen. So let's look at verse 13 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He says, brothers, we don't want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. He says, we believe. Now, let me just say, here's the essence of Christianity. And Paul puts it here very, very plainly. He says that Jesus died and rose again, so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep according to the Lord's own word. We tell you that we who are still alive, we who are left to the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we'll be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. And that's what my goal is today. 
Today is a start of what we're calling the peak. We want to go to the mountaintop with God. And wherever your journey is with the Lord, we want to spiritually take you by the hand and take you higher to the peak. And by the knowledge that we have and that we're learning from the scriptures, hopefully it would draw us closer to the peak with Jesus. Amen. To eventually, when the Lord's return come, we hear the trumpet sound and we are being lifted up to be with the Lord. Amen. So I want to encourage you with three reasons we as Christians have hope. And the first reason, if you're taking notes, is this. Christ is coming again. Jesus is coming again. If that's the first time you're hearing it, let me remind you, Jesus is coming again. Now, we don't know the day or the hour. We kind of put that out there already. We don't know that. We don't know when. But Jesus coming coming back. In fact, in John chapter 14, verse 3, Jesus said, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. I will return and take you to be with me, so you also may be where I am. Jesus said, I'll be back. Arnold Schwarzenegger didn't coin that phrase. No matter what you think, Jesus said it first. He says, I'm, I'll be back. Okay, I'm returning for my bride. I'm coming back for my church. Okay, and that's what he's saying. So in the early church, they were so excited about the return of Jesus that they actually had a greeting that they would use to greet one another. It's something like when you see somebody else and say, hey, what's happening? How's it going? What's up? They had a, a word, a phrase, Maranatha. They would go to their brothers in Christ and say, Maranatha. They would go to sisters in Christ, Maranatha. They would tell everybody who were a believer, Maranatha. And Maranatha means our Lord is coming. I want you to get that excitement, that anticipation that the early church was anticipating of the Lord's return any moment. That was the excitement. Now, do we sense the excitement that today in our churches? Not many churches. Not many churches are excited. Not many churches can say, Maranatha, he's coming back. In fact, the scripture says that those of you that long for the Lord's return, that there's a crown for you in heaven. Now, check that, check that out. Those of you that can't wait for him to come back, there's some anticipation. There's a crown for that anticipation. Not many people want to get that crown because they're not anticipating. But those that are excited, those that are anticipating, there is a special crown for that anticipation. There's a reward of a crown for those who long for the returning of the Lord. The problem is most of us won't get a crown because we are more in love with the world than we are in love with the Lord. Am I speaking the truth this morning, this evening? In fact, I'll be really honest with you tonight. There was actually a time when I was 18, young adult, that I told the Lord, don't come. Don't come, Lord. I want to get married. <laughs> Anybody with me? <laughs> Don't come yet. Don't come yet. Then the kids started coming. Lord, come quickly. <laughs> Lord, come quickly. Where are you? Where are you? And I tell you what, I say it even more louder with, with all the, the junk that's going around the world. Lord, come now. Come now. Maranatha, he's coming back. In fact, this is what Paul said in the, in the passage here in Thessalonians. He said this, we believe that Jesus died and rose again, so we believe that God will bring Jesus, will bring Jesus to the earth to get his bride. This is his return. Those who have what? Those who have fallen asleep now, what does that mean, falling asleep? And as Christians, we have a hard time digesting that sometimes. It's a poetic way that Paul puts it. My red thing fell. But anyway, sidetracked. <laughs> a poetic way where Jesus says they were asleep. In other words, they were dead. 
14 times or so in the Bible is mentioned the Greek word as asleep. And in John 11, it is used of Lazarus who had fallen asleep or had died before Jesus raised him from the dead. Look at verse 16, again in, in chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God. Now look at that for a moment. Let's just stop there. Let's just pause there because this is awesome right now. The Lord himself will come down. I don't know if you have a good, vivid imagination. The Lord himself will come down. And remember, God spoke and created the word. God spoke and it was done, right? And there were times when God would whisper. And this time, when Jesus returned, what's going to happen? There's going to be a loud command. And the voice of the archangel, Michael, is going to give a shout. And the trumpet will sound, give a loud blare. Why? Because the greatest victory in the history of the world demands the greatest shout from the Lord. Saying, church, here I come. Church, here I come. Hey, bride, here I come. And then the trumpet will sound. The trumpet of God sounds. The archangel cries. The Lord shouts. And what happens? The Bible says in verse 16, the dead in Christ will rise first. The dead in Christ will rise first. Who are the dead in Christ? Well, remember what Paul was talking to the Thessalonian believers. And he said, you know what, guys? Your loved ones who were Christians and died, they're going to rise up first. They're going to rise up first. In other words, you know, to be absent of the body is to be in the presence of the Lord, right? We've heard that. So here, the body will have a new body and unites with the soul. Think about that. Now, that's something in our heads. Maybe we cannot wrap around. Just like the Old Testament people were saying, yeah, the Son of Man is going to be born from a virgin. That's the same mentality that we may be having this evening. But it's going to happen. It's going to happen. All right? Now, I don't want you to get confused here because it could be easily confused. So I'm going to go really slow on this, okay? It appears to be very clear that there's two resurrections. The first resurrection is for those who are Christians who have died and they're being raised. That's the first resurrection. The second resurrection is for those who were not Christians, who were not believers. It is known as the resurrection of the dead and they will be judged very differently than those from the first resurrection. And we're going to look at this a little bit more next week. The Christians will be judged at the Bema seat. And they will be judged for the good works. That's where they'll receive their crowns. Now the non-Christians, they'll be facing the great white throne judgment. That's for the unbelievers. You don't want to be there. Don't worry. You're not missing anything. All right? So don't worry about the great white judgment, the white throne judgment. Okay? You will not be there if you're a Christian. And these non-Christians, these non-believers, those that have been living in sin... Those that continue to do wrong, they'll notice that their name is not written in the book of life. No matter how much they plead to God at that moment, God is going to say, God's not going to say, maybe I messed up. No. If your name is not written in that book of life, then you are where you need to be. Okay? Okay? We're we're talking here about the first resurrection. The resurrection of those who were Christians. In fact, in Revelation chapter 20, verse 6, it says, Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. If you're dead, this is the one you want to be in. Okay? And the only way you're going to be in there before you die is by acknowledging that Jesus Christ is Lord and you have accepted him as your savior. That's the only time. You can't backtrack. You can't say, God, pause time. Let me have a moment with you. No, there's no no time for that then. And then the Bible says, what? The second death has no power over them. 
If you're part of the first resurrection, the second death has no power over you. What does this mean? Well, someone said it and put it this way. You can be born once and die twice, or you can be born twice and die once. What does that mean? You can be born one time, and that one time is your mama, your mommy, your mom shouted, pushed you out, and there, that's your birth. Okay? That was it. Ah, there it is. Okay? There's the baby. It's that easy, right? <laughs> now I'll get emails from all you women that have babies. <laughs> okay? So that's the first birth. If you're only born one time, you will die twice. You will die a physical death, and then you will stand before God and the judgment and the spiritual death, and you'll be casted to eternal hell. Okay? The good news is, if you're born twice, you die once. In other words, you have that physical birth, then you have that spiritual birth where you accept Jesus Christ, and then we know the story of, of John chapter 3 of Nicodemus. He says, how can you be born twice? How can I go to my mother's room? And Jesus begins to talk to him about the spiritual birth. Your old life is gone, forgiven, transformed, made completely new. Okay? That's the second birth. So what do we have? We have, number one, the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the second point, if you're writing notes, taking notes, is that there will be a rapture. There will be a rapture. What is the rapture? The rapture is when the living believers, the living Christ, uh, Christians are taken up, taken away. Look what verse 17 says. After that, we who are still alive, are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. After the first resurrection, after the dead in Christ will rise up, then the rapture of those that are alive that are believers okay you're a believer and a follower of jesus christ you who are still alive will be caught up in the air now the word caught up the greek word is harpazo or harpazo however you want to pronounce it it's the same spelling whatever however your pronunciation you do it but it means to be seized it means to be caught up it means to be rescued we're being caught up rescued from this corrupt world amen what is something to look forward to for the rapture of the church i believe it's very imminent i believe it's very imminent church in fact there are three different beliefs some believe on the pre-tribulation some believe in the mid-tribulation some believe in the post-tribulation. Again, I'm not here to debate you. I'm, gonna hear, I'm, gonna, I'm here to tell you what I believe, what the Bible is saying, and what we as the assemblies of God believe in, okay? And pre-trib, pre-tribulation, will be those who believe that Christians are rescued or raptured before the tribulation, before things get really bad. The mid-trib are people that believe Christians will be rescued in the middle of the tribulation, of the seven-year tribulation, right in the middle, before the second half. Then there's those that believe in the post-trib. Those people believe that they'll be rescued after the tribulation. Now, as I said, I believe, as I agree with the Assemblies of God, that we will be raptured pre-tribulation. I'm going to tell you why. Because of this verse I'm going to share with you, because of God's goodness, he rescues us. He takes us away. He snatches us away. This is how Jesus describes it in Matthew 24, verse 39. And I want you to pay very careful attention to this because this is how Jesus says it will happen. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. And he goes on to say, two will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Now, I don't want you to miss this application, this teaching right now. Because Jesus says, so you also must what? You must what? You must also be ready because the Son of Man 
will come at an hour you do not expect. Okay? So if you're a believer in Jesus, this is really, really serious that he is returning. That at the trumpet sound, you must be ready because it could happen at any moment, at any time. And when it does not even feel like it's going to happen, it might happen. In other words, what this passage of scripture is saying, there will be two people, let me put it in, in, in today's lingo, there will be two people typing in the office, working on the computer, the rapture takes place, one gets raptured, one does not. It could mean that two people uh, uh, can be sitting in a chair in a church service, one gets caught up and one is left behind. Amen. It could mean that you could be sitting at a dinner table with five in a family. Three get caught up, two get left behind. That's what Jesus was telling. So be ready. Be ready, be ready, be ready. Somebody say be ready. Be prepared. Be prepared by doing the Lord's work. Being sold out for him. Not with a half-hearted, lukewarm Christianity, but be ready. Maranatha, the Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. So here we talked about Jesus is coming. We talked about the rapture. Now this last point that I want to share with you, and I'm, again, I'm giving you a little skim of everything before these next few weeks. There's going to be a reunion. It's going to be a reunion. What's going to be happening at the reunion? The Bible teaches us a principle that Christians will be where? It says we'll be with God forever. Isn't that what the Bible says? So here's what the reunion looked like. Look at verse 17 and 18 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds. So what are we going to be doing? The Bible says to meet the Lord in the air. Visually, try to visualize this. The Lord is coming down. We're coming up and we're seeing him. Think about that for a moment. We're getting caught up. He's coming down and we're seeing him face to face. He's coming down, we're going up, and we're seeing him face to face. I don't know about you, but that's exciting to me. And we meet face to face the Lord who gave us this life. And then it goes on to say, and so will we, so we will be with the Lord forever. Let me hold on to this area. Let me just dig a little deeper. I want it to sink in. When this happened, when this happens, you'll be with the Lord. How long? Forever. Okay, I want you to think about that. Forever. We talk about, we'll talk about more of this next week. But I want you to talk, I want you to think about what this really means. When we're, when we're with the Lord forever, there's no more pain, no more sin, no more heartache, no more ugly news, no more brokenness, no more disease, no more sickness, no more poverty, no more starving children, no more loneliness, no more sickness, no more cancer. We're talking about being with the Lord forever. And if there's any sort of tear that may fall from your, from your eye onto your cheek, the Lord with his finger will wipe it away. Mm, I don't know about you. I just got some goosebumps. He would take his finger, just wipe that tear away. I don't know. That's exciting. So what should we do? If we're living in the end times, what should we do right now? I'll tell you what we should do. We should build bunkers, we should dig down, we should store up, we should hoard everything we need to, right? No. No. I tell you what we need to do. In verse 18, it tells us what we need to do. We should encourage each other with these words. He's coming back. He's coming back. 
Let me back up just a few statements that I said earlier about the tribulation. You think we had, and you would think you were concerned about the toilet paper and the hand sanitizer, all that Walmart being empty. I tell you what, during the tribulation will be much worse. And I think the Lord has given us a glimpse of what could be for the unbelievers. What could be for those who do not know Jesus Christ and what chaos is going to be after the church is caught up. That's why Paul is telling us we need to encourage one another because I don't want my family to deal with that. I don't want my lost relatives and my friends to go through that. I want them to be with me caught up in the air. I want them to be part of that reunion. I want them to celebrate. I want them to get excited. I don't want them to worry about it. And I believe the Lord just gave us a glimpse of the chaos that could be after the church. Think about this for a moment. When the rapture of the church takes place, the Christian pilot will be gone. There might be a Christian co-pilot. Nobody flying that plane. There's going to be cars that are driven by Christian people that the rapture takes place. There's going to be car accidents all over the place. And they're going to be calling for police officers. Those Christian police officers, they're nowhere to be found because they're caught up. They're going to be calling firefighters. And those Christian firefighters, they're going to be caught up. Who's going to drive the fire truck? Who's going to pull the hose? There'll be chaos when the rapture takes place. And you think it's bad now. It's going to get worse after the church's rapture. So we should live with an urgency there's got to be an urgency in our spirit that will long to be with the Lord forever. So what's, should we, what should we take away this evening? What should you do as a Christian? What should you do as a believer? You still got bills to pay, so pay them. You're still going to have sick kids, you take care of them. You're still going to go to activities, but what are you going to do with all that? Let me close out with this big chunk of scripture out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning of verse 51. Because this is what Paul says, and, 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 and it's, in, it's a different context, but the same story. Look, look what Paul says. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we'll all be changed. How fast is this going to happen? Check this out. In a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Let me just pause here for a moment. There is no time, once the trumpet, once it happens, there's no way of saying, God forgive me, I'm ready to go now. No, it doesn't. You, you can't pray your last prayer that way. It, it'll be too late. Blink. That's how fast the rapture takes place. You could blink right now, the microphone will, will drop, and I'll be gone. And some of you that be left behind goes, where did Pastor go? Joel go? What a neat trick. No, that was the rapture. Because I say that because not everybody that walks into the church will be safe. What, Pastor? The Bible's very clear. Not everyone that calls me Lord shall be safe. Why does he say that? Because it's the condition of the heart. You can look good coming to church doesn't mean you're gonna go out you know what I'm saying so that's why we have to be ready at all times just like the Thessalonian church when they were going and saying Maranatha the Lord's coming where did I leave off in verse 53 for the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with their immortality. In other words, when he returns, when Jesus returns, our physical bodies are going to be transformed into our eternal bodies. And we are no longer to be mortal, but we will live for him forever. And look, he goes on to say in verse 54, the saying that is real will come true. Death has been swallowed up in, in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Here's the kicker in verse 57. But thanks be to God, he gives us what? The victory. The victory. 
not through our religious efforts, not because you may have a perfect attendance at church, not because you know that many scripture in the Bible, not because you do all these good things, not just because we're doing, we're stopping bad things, but he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about him and all his glories. Look what verse 58 says. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself, what? Fully to the work of the Lord. Fully. It's not saying you do this one week and don't worry about the rest of the week. Don't be nice. Be nice on Sunday, but you could be the, the, the worst crooked Christian on the rest of the week. No. You have to give yourself up fully. Fully. Fully to the Lord. <clears throat> Serve him. Praise him. Worship him. Give in his name. Share his love. Live with intensity. So as we see the day approaching, as we see that the end times is taking place, as we see that we are in the last few hours, then we need to do everything we can to represent Jesus Christ in everything we do, in everything we say. God has not called you to be a part-time believer. Being a Christian is a full-time job. You can't wake up one morning and say, you know what, God, I'm going to call in sick today. I don't want to be a Christian today. I'll pick it up tomorrow. What would happen if the rapture takes place at that moment? What would happen? God, I don't want to serve you today. What? God, I don't, I don't want to lead this ministry. God, I don't, want to, I don't want to do this for you. God, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. What? That's not what I created you to be. I created you to worship me. I created you to serve me. Let me ask you this question. If you knew that Jesus was coming back on Friday, how would you act? How would you live? If you knew that today is Wednesday and Jesus said, I'll be back on Friday, how will you be leaving, uh, living tonight, tomorrow, and whatever time on Friday? How will you be living? You'd be straightened up, weren't you? You'd be praying. <laughs> You'd be telling everybody about Jesus. Okay? Again, we don't know the day or the hour. And that's why we need to be ready for his return. We need to be ready when the trumpet sounds. <clears throat> now, here I may step on some toes. Okay, you ready? You'll come and play the guitar there. Listen carefully. We have a bunch of lukewarm Christians. We have a bunch of lukewarm believers. And what does the Lord say about that? Blech. It's going to vomit you out. We have a bunch of lukewarm, apathetic, worldly church going people because we have forgotten about the good news we have forgotten about Jesus we've forgotten about what God did for us we've forgotten that we have become so complacent I'm talking about the body of Christ I'm talking about the church as a whole I'm not just talking about victory I'm talking about everybody who calls upon the name of the Lord we have become lukewarm believers, apathetic, worldly, church-going people because we've forgotten about the good news. Maranatha, our Lord is coming. Therefore, we shall work for the Lord because you know that your labor for the Lord is what? Verse 58, it's not in vain. Your work for the Lord is not in vain. You can live a life that won't count in eternity or you can live a life for the Lord today that will bring Him glory. 
for me it's not a, a no-brainer I want to live for the Lord that will bring him glory and I think deep down every single one of us has a desire to do that but deep down we have been so caught up with the world that we miss it we miss it let me read one last verse Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 the scripture reminds us let us not give up on meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but let us encourage one another all the all the more as you see the day approaching every single day the day is quickly approaching what is that day the day is the rapture of the church that's the day that's the day it's the rapture of the church as we're getting closer every single moment as we're getting closer to the return of the Lord there has to be more of an anticipation for the return of the Lord that anticipation will cause us to tell others about Jesus Christ that when you see people you see people through the eyes of the Lord saying they need Jesus they need a Savior they need them how will they know if you don't tell them I feel an urgency for our missionaries because they have a big job all around the world not even around the world but even in our own country boy our country needs Jesus more than ever before what we're facing is a historical never been done never happened and the church you has to rise up and tell others about Jesus stand with me tonight I just want you to close your eyes for just a moment I want you just to look at your life right now it'll be wrong of me to say thank you for coming let's pray and send you home when you may be standing here and you may not be ready for the rapture it's so exciting to see men and women that they know that they know that they're ready to be the Lord be with the Lord these last couple weeks I've been in two funerals of two Christian men that were so ready to be with the Lord talked to Marvin many times he says I'm ready pastor I'm ready I went to Judy Douglas father's funeral and all they said is he was ready he was very vocal about his beliefs he was very vocal about the return of the Lord those signs that you see on 56 going towards French Lake he put those up he's very vocal on his faith but there's some here in this room we're not even telling our own family members about Jesus you know I really believe I really believe that there are some people are not excited about the coming of the Lord because they're so caught up with the worldly things we're caught up with the worldly possession we're caught up with the daily day-to-day -day things we're caught up those things don't matter those things won't get you get you to heaven those things you can't take to heaven we need to understand our relationship with the Lord is so important So every head bowed, every eyes closed. Just examine yourself this evening. Just look deep down in your heart tonight. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I want you just to make this very personal with 
with the Lord. Just make it very personal with the Lord and say, Lord, I thought I was ready. But if you come right now, I don't think I'll be going up. I will not be part of that rapture. Your word says that one will be working. Two will be working, one will be taken up and won't be left behind and you might be here tonight and you may say man I'll be the one left being left behind can you imagine your children going to heaven you're not or your spouse gets caught up in the rapture and you're not I'm not saying to do it for them I'm saying to do it for you do it for you. So as I pray, I want you to stand right where you're at and just begin to pray your own prayer to the Lord. Father, we come to you tonight. And Father, sometimes the topic of the end time, the topic of the rapture, Lord God, scares us. And probably it scares us because deep down we know we're not ready. But Lord God, for others, they're excited. They can't wait for the return of your son Jesus Christ for the church but Lord God I pray that every single person that leaves this place today will know that they'll be ready they'll be ready so Father I pray for every single man every single woman in this room tonight that their hearts will be ready and right where you're standing if you need to say Lord Jesus forgive me confess my sins to you and I just re-invite you into my life again help me to live for you help me to tell others about you God help me to be your son your daughter help me hear you say well done my good and faithful servant father we don't know when you'll release that angel and release your son to come for the church Lord, your word says very clearly, we don't know the day or the hour, but we need to be ready. So, Father, we are getting ready right now. We're getting ready right now, God. Move in every single person here today, Lord. We open our hearts to you tonight. We ask for forgiveness. We invite your son, Jesus, to come into our lives. Father, help us to encourage one another as we see the day approaching. In Jesus' name we pray. Now, before we leave here tonight, I want to encourage you by saying one statement. If every single one of us made it right with God tonight, and if the rapture takes place at this moment, I pray we all go. But as, the long, as long as the Lord tarries, you have to represent who Jesus is in you. Don't stir up trouble in the social media. Don't cuss up a storm on social media. Don't get ugly with your neighbor or your family. Be Christ-like. Be a representation of someone that says, you know what? I want what you have. I want what you have. They want the love of Jesus Christ in their life. But if you're being a hypocrite, we use that word a lot in the church lingo, hypocrite, and you are one and you become one, nobody wants to be with Jesus like you. You'll become a big turn off and a big turn on. I want to turn on people to Jesus, not turn people off from Jesus. Amen. I'm saying that with the bottom of my heart with all the love. Because I want you to be a good representation. We as a church, we want to be a good representation for who Jesus is in our lives. Amen. Well, God bless you guys. Thank you for being here in the relaunch of our Wednesday night service. I want to remind you, this is the last Sunday that you have to register. Okay? So please do that. Go to our church website. Go to our church app and just click a service you want to attend. 9 or 11 o'clock, and then the July 28th, you could attend it, whatever service, you don't have to check in, and uh, um, looking forward to that, amen.
Well, God bless you, Maranatha, okay? The Lord is coming, all right? God bless you. Have an awesome rest of the week. Men, don't forget about men's breakfast this Saturday at 8 o'clock.